Hey gang, Pastor Phil here. I am starting something new. Now when I say starting, I don't know if this is going to be episode one of one or whether we're going to do this more often, but those of you that attend our church regularly know that from time to time on Sunday mornings, I will stop in the middle of my sermon and say, I wish I could say this, but I don't have time. And uh, I've been getting a lot of feedback on my communication, and it's been really good communicate, uh, good feedback. Feedback is usually I talk too fast, I say too much, or I say too much and I talk too fast. So these little uh, videos are something that's going to help me get more of this information out without talking too long on Sundays. So I came up with this name, Monday Morning Leftovers, even though today is Tuesday. Uh, these are the things I wanted to say on Sunday morning and just uh, ran out of time. So we're going to dig right in. It, it's not going to be real organized. There's no handouts, there's no notes, this is just raw video unedited, not stopping and starting, just me talking to camera, trying to get out some of the things that God put on my heart I couldn't say on Sunday. This past Sunday, we talked about compassion. I just want to pause right here and warn you a couple things. Number one, what I want to share with you today is heavy and it's uncomfortable and it's graphic isn't the right word, but uh, if there's some young listeners here, like if you're uh, if somehow, if you're a a child or elementary age student or even a teenager that stumbled on this video, can you pause right here and just make sure that a grown-up is listening along with you or uh, this might not be something um, appropriate for you, for you to hear at this point, the topic that I want to address this morning. Um, also, if you don't have time to listen to this video the whole way through and you're just going to take little snippets out, why don't you pause here and come back when you have a couple minutes to listen to what I have to say. So, that being said, let's jump into it. Uh, I didn't get to talk about compassion bias on Sunday morning, and so to jump back into what that was, um, compassion, as I defined it Sunday, is a deep awareness of the suffering of another person combined with a compelling desire to relieve it. So it's being aware that someone else is struggling that leads to a compelling desire to relieve it. And I do understand that Christians aren't the only people who are compassionate. Now, me personally, I'm a follower of Christ. I, um, I'm a practicer of the disciplines of Christianity. And what that means is that I have exchanged my life for Christ's life. I've actually accepted forgiveness. I have uh, declared the lordship of Jesus Christ over my life. I have surrendered control of my entire operating system to Christ, and I have invited him to come and actually, the per I've invited the person of Jesus to come and live inside of me. And so um, he lives in me now, and I recognize that, and I experience that, and I feel that on a daily basis. His entire person bleeds into my person, and it bleeds into the way that I think, and it bleeds into the way that I develop uh, attitudes and uh, feelings and emotions and and the hope is that it he so consumes the inside of me that he comes out of me in the way that I live and the way that I make decisions and one of the things that came along with Jesus that lives in me is Jesus's compelling compassion and if you study the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels of the Bible you will see uh, there was no more compassionate human being that ever walked the face of the earth than Jesus. He was deeply aware of the suffering of other people and lived with a compelling desire to help relieve that suffering. And I spent a lot of time talking about that on Sunday. Um, you know, so compassion, it, we normally think about it, it manifests itself at times in these, uh, when you feel a sense of compassion, you feel these warm, uh, fuzzy, tear-inducing, colors of, of pa compassion, uh, when you feel a, a real desire to actively get involved in helping to relieve the suffering of, of people that we perceive as victims, people we have empathy for, um, you know, so compassion will manifest itself in things like helping, uh, hurt, you know, natural disaster victims or helping the materially poor, uh, helping those who are sick or have different disabilities or who are, uh, unwillingly unemployed, you know, people in that category of life, people who we see as victims of circumstances. And we have empathy for them. We see ourselves in them. But I introduced this term that I didn't unpack Sunday morning called compassion bias. And what I mean by that is that I am convinced that each of us struggles to apply compassion 
uh, broadly across the spectrum of humanity. Uh, more simply, uh, that there are just certain groups of people I have an easier time showing compassion to than others. And what I am recognizing in the uncomfortable part of the conversation today is that the compassion of Christ will challenge and confront and convict me when I begin to raise an awareness of suffering of people for whom I have no empathy. In other words, it's easy for me to have compassion towards someone that I have empathy for, that I can identify with, that I see as a victim of consequence. It is much more difficult for me to have compassion for someone that I have no empathy for, that I have uh, no like for, that I might even have disgust or disdain or anger towards someone that I don't see as a victim of a, of a consequence, but I see as a, as a convict or a victim of their own choices or consequences. And this is a very uncomfortable place for me. I didn't expect that uh, to come out of this situation. Uh, for example, let me just tell you a couple stories and then we'll wind this thing up. Uh, it's easier for me to have compassion when, uh, for instance, a a man and a woman who are engaged to be married come to meet with me in my office uh, in a premarital counseling situation and they confess to the pastor, um, you know, we're having a really difficult time controlling our sexual urges. We are in love, we're deeply attracted to one another, we know we're getting married and we have not been sexually abstinent. And we, we want to be sexually abstinent, there's some guilt there, but we're just not able to control these urges that we have. We're not finding success for that. It's it's easier for me to find compassion for that because here's a heterosexual couple who's trying to do the right thing biblically by coming together and getting married. They are admitting that they have these urges that they can't control. They're urges that as a heterosexual male I can identify with and have empathy for. Um, in that environment, it's, it's a little easier for me to find compassion and minister grace and mercy. Not in the sense of telling them that it's okay. That's not compassion. Compassion is helping them to relieve their suffering. And the suffering is a result of the guilt they're feeling for sinning against God by having sex outside the context of marriage. But I can deliver that help, that teaching to them in a context that um, is full of mercy and grace and eliminate shame and gives them real concrete steps to move on to live a life of abstinence up until up until marriage so that they don't live under that guilt and con condemnation and you might be able to minister compassion to them too but let me flip the script for a second what if it was a young man who came into my office in his mid-twenties and says pastor I have sexual urges that I'm having a difficult time controlling now I haven't acted on them but I'm attracted to little boys I'm sexually attracted to children and I know it's wrong and I know it's disgusting and I know it is socially unacceptable but it haunts me day and night and it consumes me and it's all I think about and I don't know that I can control these urges. What we're dealing with here is someone who in clinical terms would be called a pedophile. He's a pedophile who has not yet become a sex offender if he applied to work with children in our church or in the public school system, his name probably wouldn't come up on a background check. He's not a registered sex offender. But here's a category of individual that I don't, you know, in the, my natural, I don't want anywhere near my kids. I wouldn't know how to help. I don't have empathy for it. I can't identify with that. And yet, in, as I'm listening to what the compassion of Christ is doing inside of my own heart, it is challenging me and confronting me, saying here is an individual who is suffering. They are struggling with urges that they don't want, but they are very real. And with that particular category of struggle, where do you go for help? You start typing it into search engines, help for pedophilia or pedophil you know, pedophilia recovery groups, you're gonna be flagged immediately. Uh, online. If you come out with that uh, because of different reporting requirements, you might be completely ostracized or reported to people. You could lose your job. You could stain your reputation. And a person like that really is in a situation where if they don't get help to overcome those urges, this is going to come to one of several different awful conclusions. Either that individual is going to become so stuck in guilt and shame that rather than acting on those urges, they're going to hurt themselves or they're ultimately just going to give in to those urges and go harm somebody else. 
And I have to tell you, this is a category, just one category of many across the spectrum of humanity that I have a difficult time developing compassion for or empathy for. This is the type of individual that I would want to see completely, I would want to stay completely distanced from. I don't want them anywhere around my two little boys. But at the same time, if there's never an outlet for that person to receive compassionate help to relieve their struggle, not only is that person going to damage other people irreparably, but they're going to damage themselves. You know, I was following the story of Dr. Larry Nasser, this um, convicted uh, child pornographer and sex offender who has now been accused by more than 150 women, former gymnasts, of uh, sexually molesting them in their childhood years over a period of two decades. And it's a horrible story. And I watched some of the victim impact statements after he was sentenced. They allowed different women who were abused by Dr. Nasser over a period of years, they allowed them to come into the court and actually face him face to face and uh, speak to him and uh, get some form of healing and justice for the atrocities perpetrated against him. It's just a horrible, horrible, horrible uh, situation. And I don't know if you saw this, but at the end of... Uh, at the end of those proceedings, the judge in the case uh, sentenced Dr. Nasser, and uh, she had a fiery statement for him. And you know, she said things like, "It's my pleasure to sign your death warrant. It is my pleasure to send you to jail." At one point, she even kind of fantasized out loud about. You know, possibly in prison, the same things that he perpetrated against others would be perpetrated against him. And as I'm listening to this, I'm finding myself pumping my fist. I'm finding myself cheering on the judge and what she says to Dr. Nasser. Because the fact of the matter is that um, God has a justice system. And when we do wrong, there are consequences and there are penalties. And the Bible doesn't sidestep that, and we don't either. But there is a part of me a big part of me that I found feeling a little bit guilty for how giddy I felt over this guy's sentence. And I feel very uncomfortable with that. And the thought that kept coming to my mind was, what about the thousands of other men and women like Larry Nasser, who haven't yet acted out like he has? Other pedophiles who have attraction to children sexually. And they know in their brain and in their heart that those urges are absolutely evil and they're wrong and they're socially unacceptable and they're illegal and they're plagued, but they cannot find the switch to turn those urges off. And they're watching Nasser and they're seeing their future and they don't like it and they want relief for the suffering that they have, struggling with these unwanted urges, where do they go? Who will show them compassion? Who will get down on a knee and put an arm around them and say, I may not understand, but I will help you. And I have to tell you, the thought that keeps cycling through my mind is how would Christ address that person? How would Christ address that person? probably much differently than I would, and it shows my compassion bias. I have a hard time developing compassion for people with struggles that I don't empathize with, that I can't understand, people that are in self-inflicted pain where they brought consequences on themselves. I have a hard time developing a desire to go and help them out of their struggle, to go and teach them, to go and bring correction to them, to bring support to them, to bring Christ to them. And yet... The deeper that I journey in Christ, I feel this uncomfortable force of compassion bleeding up into me. And now that I've seen into the struggles of the anonymous pedophile, the person who hasn't acted on this yet, I have to say, Jesus, what do you want me to do with that? Because here's a person who's suffering. And quite candidly, I don't know if I'm willing or able or even know how to help. 
And that is just one category in one subset of one grouping of humanity that as a practicer of Christianity and as a follower of Christ, I am mandated to demonstrate compassion to. I don't know what it looks like. It is inc incredibly uncomfortable. But here's the thing about compassion. Once God shows you the suffering of another person, you cannot unsee it. And you can't walk away from it. And it's a heavy, uncomfortable feeling. It's the same feeling you have when after a ball game downtown, you walk out of the stadium and you're going past somebody sitting on the street who appears to be homeless and they're begging for money. And the moment that you see them, you feel uncomfortable. And you have to figure out what you're going to do with that feeling of discomfort. Do you just not even make eye contact? Do you walk by them quickly so that you can escape the moment? Do you stop and put some money in their hand because it's better than doing nothing, but it doesn't obligate you to really get involved? Do you stop and do you take a knee and do you make eye contact and ask that man or that woman, tell me your story, I will help you. Compassion is uncomfortable for many of us. Because if you really give in to the compelling compassion of Christ, what you'll find yourself wanting to do is to recklessly jump into the life of people who are suffering, regardless of the cost, regardless of the contract, regardless of whether or not you have a plan or not, but you feel this compelling desire to immerse yourself in the suffering of other people in such a way that you can help relieve it. And that doesn't always lead to a neat and tidy end. Compassion will cost you more than you ever expected. It'll cost you more financially. Giving yourself to compassion will make you re-examine the way you spend money, the way you spend time, the way that you think about people. It'll cost you everything. Look how much it costs Christ. Look how much his compassion cost him, it cost him his life. And yet, that is what differentiates the compassion of Christ from the world's version of compassion. It's corrective. It's Christ conscious. It's Christ centered. It's costly. So I didn't get to unpack that on Sunday morning. And I don't know what the conclusion of it is. But my challenge to you is you've, if you've made it 17 minutes into this uh, version of Monday morning leftovers is this. Who are, are those groups of people that you simply in yourself have no compassion for? That you have no empathy for? Who are those groups of people for whom you have compassion bias? And how might the Holy Spirit be talking to you today about looking deeper into their life past what you see into the deep level of spiritual suffering that they have? How might God be able to open your eyes and your insight in such a way that you can be a conduit for the compassion of Christ to work through you and minister help to people and their suffering, to relieve the suffering that they have. It's ugly. It is uncomfortable. It's in many ways unstomachable. It's controversial. But it's part of the journey of being a disciple of Jesus. So that's today's episode of Monday Leftovers. See you again next week.